I'm glad you guys are here for our monthly webinar for the Center of Subsurface Energy and the Environment here at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm an associate professor in the department here. And there's our website. Now let's make sure I'm clicking right here. There we go. Okay, these are all our members of CSEE, some familiar faces, smiling, not so smiling, all nice people. I know them all, good people. They do good stuff. Okay, just to give just a little overview of the research we do, we have all different subsurface applications. Some of this conventional oil and gas, some is tight. It's kind of stuff we'll be talking about today, but we also do some CCUS, geothermal. Got lots of webinars and all these things. Okay. So we also have um, many industrial affiliate programs with, uh, within C CSEE. Um, we love giving, getting feedbacks from, from our industrial affiliates and they give us good ideas for our new research projects. So it's a back and forth and I'll be emphasizing this a little bit today in my talk. Um, again, we do this every, we do this monthly. These are industry driven webinars. Um, <clears throat> usually a professor here at the University of Texas at Austin or one of our collaborators. These are some of the ones we've done in the past. Oh, here's mine, poor occupancy of gas hydrate. I did that like a couple months ago. Other really interesting ones here, challenges and opportunities with geologic hydrogen done by Hugh last month. Um, these are again, the, the, the second Tuesday of each month at noon, which is right now. And we're glad you're here via Teams. Um, and we're gonna put them up on the YouTubes and upcoming, here's the important ones. Maybe you just wanna watch those instead of mine. Oh, I think mine's pretty good. Ryosuke Okuno is going September 12th, Makul Sharma October 8th, and Zoya Haidari is on November 12th. So um, we do have sponsorship opportunities for some of our affiliates, industry. We do, you know, if you want to sponsor us, $5,000 per webinar, you get your name and logo prominent webinar flyer at the beginning and end of each webinar. Live audience, uh, lots of industry professionals watching these things. Um, these are publicized to public and private audiences, and these are posted on YouTube after the live event. So benefits, you get again to reach a global target audience, all the standard benefits, as you guys all know, okay? Um, if you're interested, there's your man, Hugh Daigle. There's his information. I'll leave it up here for a second. You can also watch it on YouTube and pause it if you'd like, so you make sure you get his name right. Okay, today's webinar is me. Okay, most, most important part here. Please post your questions in the question and answer section. When you think of a question, if you have any question, don't wait for the end. You can just type it in right now. I will get to them all at the end. Most of them, if they're interesting questions, I get to choose. It will probably you choose your question. Please put them up there. I will um, answer as many questions as I can at the completion of today's presentation. So again, this is my talk today, Water Production Permian. Where is the water coming from? And there's a picture of me, but you see me talking to you also. Um, I'm older than last time I did this, so I look a little older. Uh, I'm a social professor here in the department. Let me tell you a little bit more about myself and why I'm interested in these problems that come from the field. So um, <clears throat> about myself and my research group, I have a PhD in physics. I didn't even know petroleum engineering existed until I was 25 years old growing up, growing up in Ohio um, and spending time in New York State. Um, I, I, I became aware of it when I became a researcher at Stanford, and then I spent time with the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the Agriculture Research Service because there's a lot of overlap between flow in soils and flow in rocks. And again, I started as a physicist. I've been at UT Petroleum Engineering since 2007, and again, this is the big thing. I'm interested in flow problems which are derived from the field. I've gone back and forth between the ag land and agricultural engineering land and the, and the petroleum land, but I'm happy to be petroleum land because I think we have a lot more interesting flow and porous media problems. And we're always getting new ones because people are always trying things in the field. And that's what you guys are doing as companies. And that's what we like to know about where all the questions are coming from. Okay, so let me give you a couple examples of all this. This is kind of how I see how academia fits in the petroleum engineering world. And this was one of the first projects I worked on when I was a postdoc at Stanford. This was three-phase flow. How does this all come about? Well, they're doing Prudhoe Bay, and then they take up some cores. They see really low residual saturations at Prudhoe Bay. And they're like, wow, that's nice. We're getting a lot of this oil out. That's great. Okay. So the question is, well, why? You know, okay, we can just keep going and just not think about it anymore and just say, hey, we're doing well, we're doing great. But hey, let's think about it because then we maybe want to repeat it somewhere else. Okay. 
So what we do, we hear about these things from affiliates like watching this right now. Um, but uh, what was done going on at Stanford is we were designing and performing experiments on simplified systems. This is something we're good at doing in academia, trying to get to the fundamental physics of the problem. Okay, and so we're just looking at oil and water and stand packs. And we find out that the results <coughs> that we see in our experiments match that the controlling physics for why we get such low residual oil saturations is that there's a layer formation. And that's caused by three phase flow in the gravity drainage setup. And now this is kind of no longer a researcher, it's much smaller research topics because it's become kind of standard practice now. Because why? See into the field and it's confirmed in laboratory and modeling setups. So this is kind of how the field moves forward. Things people trying crazy things in the field, we're taking about trying to understand why they work well or why they don't work well. Let me give you another example. Okay, so overview. I'm going to use the same eye to model for water production in unconventional formations. This is a good big question right now. And I, I, I've heard from many companies and I've talked about different things about what the possibilities are. Um, also looking for input from you guys. OK, so we know that when you hydro, hydro, hydraulically fracture these formations and we need to do that to get good rates for oil production, you're going to introduce water in there. Is this a problem? Um, there's also water initially present. And also there's a lot of heterogeneity. Can there be a lot of hydrogenity? Do these heterogeneity and these, these formations play a big role in this water? That's what I'm going to be talking about today. But I'm going to use the same onsets, the same idea that I talked about already with the three-phase flow for this particular case for um, water production in the Permian. So I like to think about that's the pic picture of how we operate under. Okay, so let's get down to doing this. We know that when you fracture the rocks, you don't get all your water back. Okay, so you, when you hydraulically fracture a rock, and we like to hydraulically fracture a rock, here's my little cartoon or horizontal. My student made this cartoon; it's quite nice. A little horizontal well, and then you you jam water and sand in here at high pressure. You crack open that rock, so now you get more surface area for the oil to flow back into our fractured well, and then come back up here. But in this process, we, you're always going to get some water invading into your rock, into your fracture face. How much of an issue is this? Now, you always get some water invasion when you drill a rock, but here we're putting in a lot of water at a lot of high pressure. And these are very tight rocks. So capillary forces matter a lot more for these than in, in, in conventional formations. And the tightness of this rock, does this cause more of a problem with the water? Okay. So this invaded fluid is going to reduce our relative permeability to oil due to multi-phase flow. How much is it? Okay. So we want to do some simple experiments to do this. Now, this is all done in the field. This is all done at high pressure. This is all using shale rocks. And for all of you guys doing unconventionals, you don't get much flow in a little bit of shale. You need a lot of shale to get good flow. So what we do in our experiments is basically we're going to mimic a little section of this and we're going to invade water like we see here in this little section. And we're going to look at this little core here to try to understand the fundamental physics of where that water is going. OK, and how much is it blocking the reservoir? OK, and so we're going to do this using a rock here. And now it'd be nice to use shale rock. But unfortunately, with shale rock, we're going to have we can't measure the flow because the flow is too small. So we're going to use actually a higher permeability rocks and then try to scale it back to the shale rocks. So let me show you the experiments that we've done on this problem already. Um, <clears throat> so water block in low permeability homo uh, homo homogenous rocks. So we did this in uniform rocks. OK, and basically we're doing this thing where we take this. We take a rock here. We have a little core holder. We can flow in both different directions. We can measure how much stuff comes out. We can CT scan this to see where the fluids are, and we can measure the pressure drop as we do our flow. So we do a three-step process. The first thing is we take our cores, we saturate them with hydrocarbon, and then we probably do a little fracture fluid injection, which means we inject a little bit of water coming in the face. So that just like we get, just like what happens in the field, we get some water to the face, and then we basically then we inject hydrocarbon from the side and basically looking at the pressure drop. How much is this water destroying our permeability? And how does it clear or does it always destroy permeability? 
Okay, so this is done by a former postdoc of mine, Rafael Longoria, and a former uh, student, Tian Bo Liang, and another former student, Xiao Liu. These guys did these great experiments on this type of stuff. Okay, and what they did is they measured this pressure drop during the flowback. And again, we're looking at high, high pressure, it means that eh, it's not flowing so well. Low pressure, going back to the original one here. And what we look at is pressure drop versus time. Um, and what we see here that if we have this basically low permeability, not that low permeability, three millidarcy here, that we see that basically this, this water is causing a problem versus time, but all of a sudden it breaks after a certain amount of time. In our experiments, it takes 10 hours. If you use a little bit low, higher permeability, it breaks in seven hours. And if you use even higher permeability, it breaks even faster. And this break is what we want. This is basically getting back to the original permeability. And we can understand this basically. Why does this occur? Well, we looked at CT scans of this. And what happens is this is basically the saturation here plotted versus, versus the distance from the fracture face. The black line is how much water is invaded into a rock originally. And it invades in a nice, um, um, basically a piston-like invasion. And then we basically are flowing back the oil here. And after a one hour flood, we see that basically the water, some of the water comes out, but very little of the water comes out of a formation, just a tiny bit. What we see instead is we see, this is we're looking at water saturation. We see the water moving further into the rock. And this water moving further into the rock is something you want. Why do you want it? Because what happens is that when this break happens is exactly when we see this capillary end effect go down. So capillary end effects matters a lot in these rocks because the permeability is so low and the capillary forces are so high. Now, these ones aren't that high, perme low permeability or capillary forces, three millidarces, 14 millidarces. But the important part is we can scale this and we can understand the physics so we can scale this to our nano Darcy rock or a micro Darcy rock and we can say basically, hey, as the permeability goes down, it takes longer and longer for this water block to clear. And we find out from these, our experiments and our, our different things and our models that this clearance time um, um, scales as the permeability of the minus one half. Okay, and that's the controlling physics, first of all. And in this field, this corresponds to two to three months. So with real unconventional rocks, if it's a uniform unconventional rock, we're talking like um, one micro Darcy or 100 nano Darcy's permeability, it takes about two to three months for this water block to clear. Okay, and it clears by the water going into it. In some sense, so this was a problem like seven, eight years ago. You can look at these times here, maybe nine years ago when these papers were written. Um, this was the big problem. Is, is there a, a better way? Is this water causing us many issues? And we can see here, well, maybe for a couple months, but we're going to be producing these things for longer. It really shouldn't be a big deal. Hey, and it's nice to fracture the rock because we can we can do it anyway. So, so this is another example of field questions that we can take to the lab and understand. Okay. So again, the operator, here's the example. Let me just, just give you a summary of this. Operators develop a combination of horizontal wells and hydraulic fracturing. This was not done at the University of Texas at Austin. This was not done at Texas A&M University. Ha, of course not. It wasn't done at either place. It was done by people out in the field making this go. And then the question becomes, how much is this hurting our current and eventual production? These are the questions that we can take back to the lab. We designed to perform experiments in simplified systems, water invasion and flow back in uniform rock cores. This uniform is going to be an important part as we get to the next last part of the talk, the main part of the talk. Um, and our results match that the controlling physics is water invading deeper into the matrix caused by capillary forces. Okay, and that's we want those capillary forces to clear the water. And so then the capillary forces aren't blocking our oil. Okay, uh, so how does this go back now? We, we take this full circle back to how does this change the production? Well, these the companies, the operators have confirmation that water can work just as well as visible injection injected. So again, we're talking like 10 years ago, like should we use liquefied, liquefied uh, petroleum gases um, to do hydraulic fracturing? Because maybe this is causing us a lot of production loss. No, not really. First of all, water is a lot cheaper. There's a lot more of it. And those things aren't going to really provide a much better thing. So let's just keep doing what we're doing. We're doing the right thing. This makes the decision making easier going forward. OK, so again, just like the three phase flow problem, this is basically the water injection and the water black pot. So let me get to my main part of the talk today. And we're a little bit earlier in this. I don't have a solution yet. We're looking for it. 
and we're going to talk about different ideas here. So <clears throat> the current research objectives is basically understand water blocks in high water saturation. Two different things here, high water saturation and heterogeneous. OK, I'll motivate this more in the next slide here. But basically, we're going to use kind of the same things. But we're going to first we're going to understand this on a modeling basis. And then we're going to try to do the same thing experimentally. OK, so let me motivate this. Why I really think the high water saturation of heterogeneous is the important key points to going forward. OK, so. Motivation, we've got massive water production in these unconventional oil basins, especially the Delaware Basin here. And the Midland Basin. Okay, so what are this? What is this plot here? Is it, we borrowed this plot um, from Amadi. Um, oh, I forget from Scanlon, from Bridget Scanlon. This is her figure in her paper. Um, what she's looked at here is basically the blue big dot is basically how much water has been injected into the formation, and the black dot is how much is produced. Okay, so if you're looking at water going in and blocking the formation. How much and the water going further into the formation? That seems to be the case in the Marcellus. It seems to be the case in the Eagleford. Okay, where you inject uh, 1,380. Um, oh, I don't know what units are. These are some massive units amount of water here. You only produce 580 uh, units of water here. Okay, so you're injecting a lot more water than you're producing in the Marcellus and the Eagleford. Okay, these formations tend to be drier. OK, and the water goes in and the water stays in there because only a little fraction comes out. But then we're looking here where all the action's going on now here in the Delaware Basin. You're injecting 2,850 units and you're producing four times more. There's a lot of water there. This is a lot more than we're injecting. So now it's not just the water going in, it's the water going in and the water in place, which may be causing problems. And in additionally, just taking care of this water is another issue. And you can see this in terms of basically the water cut versus time, days online. What happens is the water cut goes down and the water cut comes back up. Water cut starts high, goes down, comes back up. This is in general what happens in a lot of these wells. I'll show you a better plot on this in the next slide. OK, so so again, so there's a lot of water coming out. Is it hurting our production? And is there ways that we can basically, where is it coming from? Is it hurting our production? And are there ways that we can deal with this? OK, we'll try to get to the first two things. The third question is kind of a big question going forward. OK, so our approach here at the University of Texas Austin with my research group is can we get some insight from just the production data before we design any of our experiments? Can we understand what's get some ideas or what's going on, uh, why we're getting so much water in the first place? So we went and um, this was with Frank Mail at the Penn State University. Um, we basically, he, Frank we did the, all this work here for looking at the actual data out in the field. And he looked at all the wells in the Permian and looked at the water cut of the initial water cut. And so mainly these wells are coming in with 70, between 60% and 80% water cut. And then look to see how they change with time. So the 80% ones, these ones start here, they, the water cut goes down a little bit to begin with and then comes back up. Okay, the ones that start a higher water cut they kind of stay at higher water cut, they barely move. But the ones that start with very low water initially, they start ramping up a lot. The general trend is a slight downturn really early on, which is probably the flow back water, and then an increase of water versus time. General, the water cut is increasing in these versus time. It seems to be a pretty much uh, single that we see here. Okay, so this is all primary production. In the primary production, the way I teach reservoir engineering, we always teach it with single phase flow. I've got all my notes from other professors before me, from Larry Lake, from Kishore Mohante, uh, from Gary Pope, and all the primary production single phase flow. This is all primary production, and it's multi phase flow, and it's multi phase flow changing in 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 in, in composition, multi phase flow as we go forward in time. This is a key question to understand first. Why is this changing? So we're going to try to understand this by some sort of modeling basis. OK, so let's just do the most simplified model. I like simple things because there are things we can replicate in the lab. There are things that we can then basically model here. So we're going to say that we have a nice horizontal well. We have nice planar fractures and then we have flow to these fractures. OK. Um, 
And so we're going to do a little modeling domain where we have our open fracture face. We have a no flow boundary on this side over here. We have a no flow boundary at the top and the bottom. And we're just going to produce this thing and make sure our model's working right and look and produce the, the oil and water out towards the fracture face and look at different scenarios of the rock inside here, of whether it's homogeneous and heterogeneous, and see if either of those can give us the water cuts that we see in the field. Okay, so this is basically just to look to see can these in general give us the right um, results that we see in the field versus water cut. So we're going to use two different descriptions of this. The simplest way is we're going to say, ah, this is going to be uniform rock. Our experiments before were on uniform rock. Okay, so we're going to do uniform rock. It's going to be, we're going to choose the right permeability. We're, not, we're going to choose, a, we're going to choose a, a representative permeability, horizontal permeability, a lower vertical permeability, a certain porosity. These are going to be tight permeabilities. And we're going to assume that uh, we're going to, in, in, in conventional reservoirs, you, you typically have an oil bearing zone, bar, bearing zone and a water bearing zone and a little bit of capillary fringe in between. But in these unconventionals, because the permeability is so low, that capillary fringe gets spread out maybe all the way across from the top to the bottom of a reservoir here. Again, we're talking only meters here. Um, and, and the capillary forces are strong to spread it out. This is one model for what's going on. You just have water and oil being produced from this basically capillary fringe, which is now, again, the whole section of the reservoir here. And how is this going to, if this is the case, how does this production go forward in time? Or let's do a different model here. We're going to say now we're going to see the simplest heterogeneous thing here. And now uh, what we're going to say, we have a small higher perm zone and a large lower perm zone. And when I talk about higher perm, I'm talking like a micro Darcy, and this is gonna be on the hundreds of nano Darcy. So there's like a, a contrast of maybe 10 or 50 or 100 in terms of permeability. And there's some evidence for this. Um, uh, uh, a former student of Peter Fleming, Sebastian, I mirror mirrors, I'm trying to remember his name correctly, basically could see this when he looked at, 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 at field course. So they say, ah, this kind of might be a better model, this layered model thing. So again, we're going to do left-hand model, we're going to do the right-hand model, we're going to see if either of these reproduces what we see in the water cut, okay? Again, the simplified cases we can do, okay? So here are the results. Again, not that hard to run these, but you kind of have to just conceptualize, as I think, the kind of the, the, what we're trying to do here. So the first model where you just say, it's just a big transition zone. For this transition mode model, with varying water saturations. We can choose whatever water saturation we want in the thing. We're gonna let the water saturation vary from capillary gravity equilibrium. And then we start the production. We look at the water cut versus time. And we can choose whatever water cut we want to begin with. We choose a water cut of 0.05 versus time. And then we let the, the model run. It stays at 0.05. We start a water cut 0.9. It stays at 0.9. We've got ones we can start at 0.45. We can start at any number we want. It just stays at that number. Okay, so now it's multi-phase flow. The fluids have different compressibilities. They have different viscosities, all these things. It doesn't matter. What you start producing initially is what you produce the whole time if it's a single layer model, okay? This is true when you increase the model height to 260 feet. Okay, made it really thick, trying to barely really spread that transition zone out. Didn't make a difference, okay? Well, that maybe doesn't look like the right model. Let's add a little heterogeneity. Can we see what happens then? Okay, so now we have a two layer model, which is getting a high permeable layer, small high permeable layer at the top, and a thick uh, lower permeability layer at the, the bottom. Okay, now it depends on the wettability of the rock for your initial case. We did three different cases. We choose a water wet, an oil wet, and a mixed wet rock. And we just use kind of standard capillary pressure curves that work with water wet, oil wet, and mixed wet rocks. Did it two different ways. We allowed the rocks, to, we allowed flow to cross flow between the layers. And sometimes we basically say that, oh, the layers are basically has a little barrier between that we don't let flow go up and down. Okay. So if we have a non cross flow case. We see that in the water wet case, the water kit, what just starts increasing, increasing first time, kind of what we see in the field. Okay. When it's oil wet, it goes the other direction. Okay, if it's mixed wet in the model, it's pretty flat again. Okay. Now we do that same model, but we turn on that vertical permeability. 
we see different patterns for cross flow. Cross flow it increases and then decreases with time. For oil wet, it decreases and then increases with time. In all these cases, we do see some temporal changes, which we did not see in the homogeneous model. And we do see in the field these changes, these temporal changes, these changes in water cut versus time. So to me, this is pretty strong evidence that the, the, the transition model is not the right model to go for. We really have to have the heterogeneities in here. Okay. And it depends how you put the heterogeneities in here. If we look at these basically non-cross flow and cross flow ones we talked about on the last slide, we look at basically how the pressures evolve inside the um, reservoir as this production is taking place. Um, this is uh, this is basically each one of these things is the pressure field color coded. The higher the the redder colors are the higher initial pressures, um, and the the bluer colors are the lower uh, fracture pressures. And again, remember, we have a high perm streak at the bottom. We have a low perm here. And so when you start producing these things here, this is just the pressure wave moving in. And again, one of the big things between unconventionals and the conventionals is unconventionals, these pressure waves move quite slowly because the permeability is so small. And this pressure wave moves very slowly at 0.1 year, at one year, at two years, it still hasn't got to the no flow boundary in the low permeability part of the zone. And in the high permeability zone, you can see it moves a lot faster, this pressure wave. This is the effect of the permeability, okay? And after one year, basically, you've drained this all out. And this is what causes the change <clears throat> in the water cut. So initially, you're basically producing this stuff that's got all the oil in it. And after one year here, you've cleaned that sucker out. And now you're producing the layer that's got more water in it because it's held at a capillary pressure. So this one's going to have more water in it because the capillary pressure is the same. So it's going to start with a higher initial water saturation if it's water wet. If it's oil wet, this is going to start with a higher initial oil saturation. So as the low permeability stuff starts being a bigger contribution of your total overall flow, uh, the oil will go up if it's an oil wet case. And there's a water wet case, it, well, the water will go up. And that's what we see here. And But interestingly, if you add cross flow, what you see here, again, you drain that oil filled layer at the top. But then you basically have the water moving into this oil white, this, this, this flow here. But this is actually producing, a, helping produce a little bit more oil through here. And you don't get as much, you actually start producing a lot more because you actually, this is actually providing pressure support to that oil bearing layer, the one with the higher oil saturation. Okay, so you can understand this on a pressure, on a, on a, <coughs> on a cross flow thing. So cross flow seems to play a big role. You can see it in the water cut here, but also um, we did some other models where we put like five layers in here and you can see different types of things changing with time again. Cross flow is uh, still the water wet's going up here, but you're still producing more. That's my next slide here. Those other ones were just on water production I and mean, the water cut. Here's total production with and without cross flow. So without cross flow, you get total um, cumulative um, oil here is going to be in the black here without cross flow. You're only going to produce 0 .00, less than 4% of your initial oil in place. But if you add cross flow in, into your model, you get to produce 9% of the oil in place. Again, the pressure support in this heterogeneous formation. Okay, so the fact that it seems to be the water cut is telling us the area of heterogeneous formations actually seems to be a good thing, and we're going to produce more oil out of these formations because of the pressure slowly going to move from that low perm zone into the high perm zone and allow that oil to keep flowing rather than just being depleted from the pressure down. Okay, uh, you can see the water changes only a little bit for the cross flow. So this cross flow seems to be something we like and seems to be something that's important. Okay. And we see that uh, on the left-hand side, I think is one is for um, the two-layer model. This is for a multi-layer model. Single-layer model doesn't make any difference because it's only single layer. Okay. So this is the initial part of our studies here. Our modeling conclusions is that the layering feature is very important. This is basically coming straight from um, looking at the water cut data and doing a simplified model. Uh, and again, our multi-layer model is the one that produces, it gives us the best match to what we see in the field. Um, the multi-layer model was based on 
multiple layers that people saw in core logs and there's other published paper telling us about how they expect the thickness of these layers to go forward and we kind of based on the models off of that okay we also find that this cross flow between layers significantly affects the production of these tidal reservoirs as i mentioned in the last slide and this needs to be if we're going to do any experiments to understand what's going on in here this should be incorporated into our proposed experimental study okay we could do modeling till the cows come home the other question is do we what kind of experiments can we do to look at this type of questions and maybe and this is their first question let's go back to our thing about where the water is going to be injected how much does that if we looking at water block is water block worse or better in these heterogeneous formations because it seems that heterogeneity is playing a big role and also along with this as the water is being produced does this create initial more water block as we're producing more water, is this creating more water block or is this continuously adding to the water block? Or are there other ways we can handle this? Okay. So let's do some experiments going back to looking at water block. We're going to do heterogeneous formations right now. And this is what my student Zeshwan is working on right now, um, doing some great work on this type of stuff. Okay. So previous cores we did were homogeneous. Everything looks like the heterogeneity plays a big role in these unconventional formations. We can't just throw that out in our experiments. As much as we'd like to, as much as it makes our life easier, it's kind of important. We need to put it in. Okay. So, unfortunately, we can't do the simplest experiments, but we can have the next level of heterogeneity. So, basically, what Zeshwan did is we wanted to uh, have a, a rock here in our experiments that we had a small high permeability layer at the top and a big section of low permeability behind that. Okay. And we want to change the wet ability. We want to change the initial setup. These are things he's working on for, for, um, right now. But our first experiments are basically we've chosen our high permeability to be Berea sandstone. That's pretty high permeability, a lot higher than these unconventional formations. But again, we're going to scale it down at the end. Okay, it's just a play way we can do our experiments and we get them done in time so students can graduate and papers can be published and information can be moved forward. <clears throat> so that's Berea sandstone in the high permeability layer. The low permeability bit layer, we're using our Texas cream limestone, which is exactly what we used in the previous experiments. Um, we're going to do the same type of experiments. We're going to use uh, our fluids. We're going to use um, uh, very uh, light oil because it tend to be light oils. And we're gonna use CT scans and pressure drop measurements to observe where the fluids are going. So let me tell you some of our preliminary results from these studies, okay? Using the same setup we did before, but now we're putting in our heterogeneous cores. Again, this is how he makes the heterogeneous cores. He basically takes some cores and he cuts them. And you'll see a picture of the next one. He cuts a thin slab of this one and slabs this one and puts them back together. <coughs> <coughs> puts a little layer of paper in between them, a little layer of filter paper to so make sure we have good cap capillary connection between the two. And then we do the same thing we did before. We fracture fluid injection here, and then we start the production out from the back end. Okay. And we're gonna do this. Um, we're gonna measure pressure drops, and we're also gonna measure fluid saturations using CT scanners. And we're lucky enough to have a CT scanner here in CSEE that uh, our group can use and other groups that can use to look at how fluid flow happens in porous media on kind of an REV scale, on a larger scale. Look at changes of saturation. So what we're going to show here is I'm going to show you the composite core construction. I'm going to show you how the water invades in three different CT scans, and I'll show you the flow back in seven different CT scans, and I'll talk about the pressure changing with time. Okay, uh, so there's the Texas cream limestone. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't have a picture of my fractured core. I don't have a picture of the slab core. Sorry, I got the wrong slide from Zeshwan here. Maybe I can find it later. But basically, we have a slab thing with this top part here is cut off, and we have a little bit of debris sandstone here. Uh, my fault. Messed up the slides. Okay. So, what do we see here? Well, let's just look at a, a full saturation thing. Here's the water invasion versus time. This is just like we did before, but now Zeshwan, since he's doing experiments vertically, he's put this is the, the y-axis is the core length. This is the fracture face here. We're injecting the water from the bottom and we see a nice uniform piston-like behavior like we did before with the homogeneous cores. Okay. And we get to water saturation about 60% in this case. It's again, piston-like invasion. 
And now this is at the after the green one, after 0.16 pore volumes of water is injected, he injected, he started pushing the oil back here and looked at how the water saturation changed with time. Um, but before I show you that, let me show you some of the slices on the water invading. So here's the early stage of the water invading. Right here, this red line here that you can see across all these cores here, that red line is the separation between our low permeability, big section here, and our high permeability in this, this, this portion of the core, okay? So early on, we only see the water invades all the way just along the bottom. These slices are further up the cores, and we basically just have oil in them initially. Okay, so this is the first one, 40, mil 40 minutes into the fractured water invasion. Now we get 80 minutes in, we can see the water is invaded a little faster in the high perm streak and to a little higher water saturation in the high perm streak. And so what Zeshwan's plotted over here is the saturation profile in the high perm layer. It went to really high, almost like 0.8. The water's really invading into the high perm zone. Not surprising, but good to see. And it's not invading nearly as much into the low perm zone. But there isn't that much difference. Again, we're just jamming it in there. It's got to get in there. Um, this is water wet rock. It's going to want both of them. Both of them want to see water. Okay, again, it's a little faster in the high perm zone. Uh, and if we go further on, we can see again, more water in the high perm zone, a little bit farther in the high perm zone. Okay, than the low perm zone. A little bit further, a little bit more saturation here. Okay. Now we do the flow back. Now we flow back and we try to produce the oil and see how the oil flows through our composite core with the hydrogen 80s. Okay. This is what it looks like. Um, for the water saturation, when I average both the high permeability and low permeability, we see that initially it was here after the water injected. And then as the water, as we flow back, again, the water moves further into the rock. And that water saturation here at the bottom drops very quickly. And I'll show you in a second, the permeability recovers much more quickly in the heterogeneous cores than the homogeneous cores. Okay, so let's just look to see what happens where the water is going, we have the CT scanner. Maybe it gives clues on where the water is going, why this is taking place. Instead of looking at the model, let's just see what it looks like actually in the field. Well, not in the field, in the lab here. Okay. So we're going to look at different places. Um, you can see this taking place versus time. Okay. So this is the first step. First step after the oil is being produced. And if you look here at the saturations, you look at the colors, hey, this high perm now has a lower water saturation. It's high perm has a lower water saturation. If you look at the water saturation here in this high perm layer, it's dropped considerably since when the water invaded. Basically, the oil tends to go in the high perm layer. And then where does the water go? Look, the water's invaded further into the rock. This is a slice right here, slice 257. It's invaded further into the rock in the low perm zone. The water likes the high capillary pressure zone, okay? So initially that water comes blasting through, the oil comes blasting through here, blasts out the water, and the water basically gets stuck from the right, right top right-hand corner to the bottom left-hand corner. So this high permeability layer is the primary channel for the flow back in the oil production. And this low permeability, water saturation really doesn't decrease, and it really starts increasing as this is the part where it's going further into the rock. This is early on after 10 minutes. Let's show you what goes on as we go to three hours. Look, now you see even more water invading in here. Where did that water come from? We're not putting any more oil into the rock, water into the rock. That oil, water's coming from the high perm zone. We like for that water to leave the high perm zone. We like for that water to leave the high perm zone because it makes it easier for the oil to flow back in that high perm zone. This heterogeneity is helping us out. Okay, we would never notice this if we did a homogeneous cores. You need to do this heterogeneity to notice this. Okay, you can see it invading here. It's getting out of the way. And as we go further in time, look, it's going even further into the rock here. Here's back in time. Here's forward in time. You can see this guy. Oh, it's water showed up here now. Again, we're not putting more water in. It's just coming out of the high perm thing. Or it's moving further into the, into the formation into the lower perm rock. Okay. So... <clears throat> Even if you're producing water in these zones, 
like what we see in the field, you're producing base, basically oil in water from these high permeability zones. That water also was being sucked into the low permeability zones and it's kind of going away. It's kind of getting out of our way for us. Doesn't seem to be a problem. Okay. And we wouldn't have known this without doing the experiments. And this is even further in time. Okay. So we can look and compare the, the heterogeneous core to the homogeneous cores. Heterogeneity is important. That's what the field results are telling us. We see huge differences in the flow back here. So again, here's the flow in. Now we've turned it on its side here so we can compare apples to apples here. This is this is flowed in this one. This is how much has flowed in, in our experiment here. This was in previous students' experiments. Um, and the flow back here took a long time for this to break here. It took like five hours. For these courses, it takes the flow back drops in 0.3 hours. Okay. The water breaks. The, 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 the multi-phase flow problem breaks. The oil flow is really nice after a short amount of time here. Okay. Again, all doing the water moving back into the other formation. If we try to do our scaling we did before, this was our scaling line. This is our K to the minus one half line here. Okay. And this is our high permeability rock. Well, the high permeability rock should go faster. We noticed that, but it went a lot faster. That plateau, when we had a water block, was expected to be almost two, two hours long, ended up being 0.3 hours long. Okay. And our low permeability rock, we still had a lot of low permeability rock. We expect to have a plateau of six hours long. It's 0.3 hours long. The heterogeneity has dropped our water block by a factor of 20 for these particular, for these particular um, our first data points here. Okay. We're planning to do more experiments. We're interested in anybody else's ideas on this, but we're basically finding that the heterogeneity is really helping us out in terms of water block and basically water blocking, water block inside capillary end effects and also water block <coughs> inside um, water production doesn't seem to be an issue for hurting our oil permeability. Still is an issue of disposing this and maybe that's another for bigger further question to look at for in, in future research here. Okay, here's now I've got the arrows coming up there. Okay, in conclusions, in conclusion, conclusion, the conclusions from this work more fracturing fluid invades a heterogeneous core sample compared to the homogeneous camp core sample. We get more invasion, high permeability, mainly invading the high permeability layer. But this uneven water saturation mitigates the effects of water blocks by quite a bit. Okay. These water blocks are less severe and water wet case production from heterogeneous unconventional reservoirs is less susceptible to the adverse effects of water blocks. Okay, so that's water blocks. There's still questions of water production. I'm happy to take any questions on the water production. If our, I think there's still questions of water production. Is like, okay, I think we're getting a picture of where we understand where the water is coming from. Is there any ways to deal with this going in the future? <laughs> because there's also disposal cost. There's also potentially might hurt the stuff in the long run. So in summary, we wanted to study problems derived from the field. Happy to hear anything people are seeing in the field. Happy to work with companies to design experiments, to fund students to get this research done. Okay. For water production, current question is how does heterogeneity affect the production and fracturing? <clears throat> the questions and, uh, questions and observations from the field are most helpful. Okay, so that's the summary of my talk today. I got some bonus slides at the end. That's the end of my slide deck. I mean, if there's any questions on these things, I can go back to some of these things. I'm going to take off the slide deck so I can see your guys' uh, questions a little bit better and so you can see my face as I answer the questions. I'm going to thank you all for your attention on this, this uh, problem. I think it's a really interesting thing going forward. I think it's a really important thing going forward. And uh, there's, there's a lot of subtleties that we can investigate. Everything you said applies to both the Delaware and Midland and other shales. And why the Delaware cut is much higher? That's an excellent question. Oh, boy. Thank, thanks, uh, Jean-Nico. Uh, um, initially, so in our models, when we do our modeling, it just the water cut 
that we start with, we get to pick with basically how much water is in the formation to begin with. In my estimation is that these formations just ended up with more initial water in them. The Marcellus just ended up being abnormally dry for some geologic reasons, which I'm not the best person to talk to about these things. The Eofort is just more abnormally dry. And the Permian just has more initial water in it that basically the charging didn't happen as much. Um, again, I think that's just the input we have here. Again, it's surprising we see such a big difference. Um, maybe it's not surprising. Everything is different in different places. Again, the previous questions were more on the, um, the drier reservoirs of the water block being a big problem in the drier reservoirs. Well, why are we worried about water block? We're producing four times the amount of water we put in here. It's a different question. The rocks are different. I really, of course, the rocks are different, but I really think just the initial conditions of the initial geologic formations are, are, are different. Um, along these lines, if I may not answer your question, but answer a question that kind of interests me. Um, Frank Mayall, who's at Penn State now, um, used to be, used to have lots of dis good discussions with him and Michael Martyr and Larry Lake here in the department. And this is, this is important to me or news to me or kind of was news and still I think is an important thing with these unconventional formations. The biggest thing that correlates with production, you can look at all the things, number of fractures, you get the depth of the thing, how close, how close your wells are together. The viscosity of the fluids, the, the permeabilities of the rocks, all these things. You just put it all in a big database and say all the different things and say which is most correlated with production, extra produ uh, higher production from these unconventional formations. And the most important thing is initial pressure. So my guess is that geologically, these formations, and especially the Delaware over, over, over the Permian, just happen to have more initial uh, pressure. It's more overpressured. That's why people are looking there. That's why all the product, that's why everybody's moving there. I'm sure the oil, the industry's figured out this well before I did, or well before I heard about this. And this is a big thing driving the Delaware. But then you have extra pressure, but you have extra water. Now you got to make choices. Okay. So I think, you know, geology gives you different things in different places. And then you have to operate your, your production uh scenarios differently in different places and understanding your physics what's controlling things differently in different places again unconventionals are very different than conventionals good work to understand the flow what information do we get from the well to support the in-situ starting point would it be advantageous to get a little more information on each pad ha it's always good to have more information um yes but Again, I, this is this is more of a, how how companies have to make decisions going forward. You know, just blast away and figure out things at the end. I'm happy people blasting away and then the information trickling down to us for figuring out what's going on at the end. I think it's important that that companies have to move fast and they have to balance those questions. Um, I guess one thing thinking about here is that we see that the layers play a big role. And maybe some of these layers are more water bearing than other layers. And if you want to want to limit the water production, somehow figure out from your most recent wells if 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 the water production is coming from certain layers, and maybe change your 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 your, your ideas uh, <clears throat> before. That's the kind of information you want to look for um, if you're worried about water production. So I hope that's a not the best answer, but. That's a little bit out of my air experience. You always have to have to balance. Do you plan to test surfactants, nanoparticles, nanobubbles, remediating or preventing water block? Ha, ah, that's an excellent question. Yes, that is something that's easily done. Not easily done. It's, I should say, straightforward. This is something that's kind of right up UT's alley. To me, it's almost like a conformance control question. And all these things, you want something to basically eliminate you want to eliminate the water layers that are, you don't want to eliminate production from those water bearing layers. Now the simulation and the early experimental, that's kind of what I thought originally. I was like, oh, okay, this is really layered. Let's just shut down these water bearing layers. Maybe we can have some sort of conformance control. 
the more we think about this problem, the more we're doing more experiments, it seems that those high layers are producing both the water and the oil through them. So, and the water is just kind of seeping in through cap, seeping in through this cross flow mechanism. So if that's the case, these things won't really provide much benefit. But again, I could be surprised and they need to be tested. And we plan to do this going forward. So um, these are the conformance control hypothesis. Is conformance control good or bad in these unconventionals? I can see it argued either way. I can see experiments giving us some things. And um, again, it's easier not to do anything. Maybe that's been the best solution in the first place, but maybe there are things that we can do to make it better. That's future research that we're planning to do. Slide 19. Two-year simulation time produces how much fluid? 0 0.01 pore volume, 0 0.14 volume more. Does change in water cut correlate with production volume? Oh, this is an excellent question. So you can look at those water cuts. We see big changes in water cuts in our in our in our models. But really, if that water cut's basically changing when your production's down by a factor of 50 or a factor of 100, do you really care? Um, I think you're going to care more about cumulative volumes than you're going to care about water cut. And that goes back to, let me see if I can get back up one of my slides here. Here we are again. Um, yeah, you can see the, the rates go way down here without cross flow. And with cross flow, they're still up high. You can see the total amount produced, less than 10%. Again, with this primary production here, Pressure support is a big thing. Cross flow is along that pressure support. And so both of these different things are going to give us different without cross flow, with cross flow are going to give us. Oops, let's go going the wrong way. Yeah, so this is the water cut here. So you have to kind of look at these things together. We have a paper that's going to be coming out shortly um, in, oh boy, I forgot the journal. One second. In energy and fuels, talking about this whole thing. And then you can kind of put these these parts, pieces, parts together in your own head. Um, it's going to be different for different people. So uh, what's the biggest play? What makes the biggest difference? What is the role of chemistry in the high water cuts? I observed that low sleep, poor water corresponds to the highest water cuts. Huh. That's news to me. That's interesting. Maybe just there's more water, so that produces a lower salinity because there's more water interacting with less rocks. Again, news to me. I like more information. These are all clues to the problem. And this is why we do questions and answering. All right. Um, again, sorry I don't have a great answer. I think it's a better question than I have an answer for. Again, I want to thank everybody. We're out of time here. Um, I appreciate all the audience members. Um, watching the webinar and thinking about these problems. Again, I think they're really interesting things going forward. Um, we're starting up a JIP ideas about understanding water in, convention, in these unconventional formations um, in terms of production and in terms of how it moves. Not in just terms of how it got there, but I know there's been a lot of interesting work on how it got there. We're talking about more of in, in the thing of how it then moves during the actually operation. And that kind of involves these pieces of parts. So again, thank you for paying attention. I want to remind you that we have a webinar coming up uh, in, in September. Ryosuke is going to be talking. It will be very good. I hope you attend. And I will see you in the next one.